Hello, this is me, Erika Stad von Holstein. And this is Luca de Biaz. Welcome to Reimagine Talks, the podcast to challenge the way we think. Today, we're here to reimagine trust with Lisa Gansky. Lisa Gansky is a pioneer, a serial entrepreneur and a best-selling author. She's a model of the original spirit of the internet. She was a co-founder of the first commercial website, GNN, acquired by AOL, and the first digital photography, sharing and printing service, Ophoto, acquired by Eastman Kodak. Gansky is the author of the best-selling book, The Mesh, Why the Future of Business is Sharing. Her work on trust, the network effect, interdependence and the sharing economy has been central in rethinking 21st century business models and community dynamics. Thank you very much, Lisa, for taking the time to be here with us today. Perhaps we should start with the fundamentals. What do we mean by trust? Well, first of all, thank you both for the invitation. I'm really delighted to join you in the conversation, and uh, we'll look. I look forward to how how we unravel trust in the next coming minutes. Um, yes, so it's a great place to start. What is trust? Um, for me, trust is a social contract. It's a um, a kind of agreement or a set of expectations that we have with each other. So um, it's really a way for us, and, and there's always a context. So maybe I trust Luca for driving, but I don't trust him for cooking. Um, and some of that can be with confidence and sincerity. So there's these two parts when we think about trust generally um, of people or institutions. As for cooking, I agree with you, and uh, trust is always a difficult thing to give. Well, we are reading all the time about the crisis of trust. Uh, Edelman, Ipsos, uh, Gallup always talking about a crisis of trust. Why should we care? Why is it so important? Well, it's a great question, first of all. Um, and as background, I think that the world is changing faster than we can learn. So what's happening is... Um, Digital technologies have changed the way that we interact with each other. They've disrupted our face-to-face -face communications, our communities. And so we're now in this place of trying to reestablish uh, rules for trust, you know, if then else, what, how do we interact with each other? And we went from, uh, in physical communities, we went from a place where we knew each other. We grew up in and generally were born and potentially died in the same community. So we had a reputation, families, all of it. Um, with transportation and digital technologies, we've continued to get more and more distant from each other through our lives. And that's really changed the way that we connect. So in the 20th century, institutions started to create forms of trust. If you think about things like banks and Uh, reputation, credit scores, and things like this, um, we were relying on many institutions or brands to represent who or what we could trust. And many of those forms were centralized. They became more and more uh, developed and centralized as a way of scaling, as a way of becoming global, because we were very obsessed with this idea that if something works locally, it should also work globally. And so we see that with education, military models, factories, um, many things became in the industrial age or in the 20th century, very um, focused on scale. And now what's happened is those institutions are being distrusted. You know, they're, they're no longer uh, considered necessarily uh, the, the stalwart of of uh, trust and value. And so, th and there's many reasons for that in many examples, which the reports that you cite uh, are do a great job of highlighting. But I think what's fundamentally happening is the way in which uh, we relate to each other has been really altered through technologies. And so we now, uh, for example, this podcast, we're in distant cities having a very thoughtful, hopefully, conversation together. Uh, having not really met. 
Um, and so for us, this is a, a fairly uh, intimate discussion, uh, well, about to hopefully not be that intimate. And, um, and we are uh, at the same time using the technology to, to um, reach many people and to engage people in a discussion. Um, for, for my taste as an entrepreneur and as a, as a technologist, the idea of using technology to engage more people and to scale uh, hopefully good ideas is fantastic. The issue, I think, is largely that society um, has moved quicker than the governing organizations. So technology moves quite quickly. Humans, uh, surprisingly, have adopted technology relatively quickly. But the lagger here is the way in which um, a trust is gated and is generally, uh, in most instances, a laggard. And so we're, um, we're out of sync. The, it, I refer to it as we're in this very privileged, actually, and exciting place as an entrepreneur between no more systems that are collapsing and uh, institutions that aren't working and forms of trust that aren't working anymore. And at the, at the interface of not yet, you know, if you squint, you can see it. Uh, a lot of these systems, like blockchain, for example, has scaffolding around it. Um, you can start to play with it, but it's not yet. It's not fully baked. It's not something that people are ready to let go of one vine and grab onto the other one. And so we're in this inflection point between no more and not yet. I think it's exciting, but it makes a lot of people nervous. So Lisa, um, if we try to squint a little bit and together look towards the future, how would you reimagine trust and where do you think we can go from here? Well, I'm um, pathologically enthusiastic uh, about the opportunity of taking a lot of ideas that are working, that work well at a local level and using technology and using a way of kind of thinking together to um, to refine what works in each place. So, for example, we're all in different cities, and we saw this with uh, the sharing economy. For example, with um, whether it was food related or transportation, uh, there's an organization called La Ruche Qui Vivi out of that started out of France. That was uh, the idea was uh, using having farmers actually be able to bring their beautiful produce and goods into cities so that people aren't shopping and buying only in grocery, big grocery chains. And um, the, the organization now, the, the company, has adapted to many different countries outside of Europe and within Europe. Um, but in the process of doing that, they've had to change the way in which they go to market in each case. Uh, the same is true with bike sharing. You know, we've seen that in different cities, um, bike sharing has to ad adapt. Um, the same, pick any example. In fact, I remember many years ago when IKEA came the first time to Philadelphia, um, the, the CEO told me a story that um, what gets sold in Europe as um, vases in the U.S. is perceived as, you know, these giant, we like to drink a lot of water in big glasses, so vases in Europe were water glasses in the United States, and it, it, they thought it was extremely funny. So th the thing is that the ideas can really work. Uh, we can learn. We, because the world is changing faster than we can learn, our really best uh, solution together is to figure out how to be pathologically curious and to create a, a learning engine so that we're constantly learning. And if we can do that at a local level and use technology to create more kind of peripheral vision to, to see what's happening in other places and learn from each other, that's kind of the best of both worlds. And, and in the case of trust, I think, um, you know, we're, it's in the early days, but I'm optimistic that blockchain can be very helpful for that um, because it's actually designed to scale local in a way. It's a decentralized uh, technology platform that is um, very tofu-like in the sense that it, it can 
it can take on the flavor of whatever's around it. So it can be good for many different uh, applications and locations. Yeah, but um, blockchain is a technology. Communities yes. are people uh, linked together in many ways. Um, is it technology who with the thing that will uh, create the solution? Is it a new way to think and develop communities? Can communities scale with the uh, blockchain? The potential is there, but the point that you raise, Luca, is absolutely spot on, which is blockchain isn't going to save us. <laughs> we have to ins we have to come together and acknowledge that we're connected. We're we're pathologically also connected. That the world is is one, and um, that the opportunity is for us to learn from each other, whether it's about climate change or trust or food or whatever the topic is. But I think that block, what I'm saying is that blockchain as a technology is um, fundamentally and arc, uh, like architecturally decentralized. It's really just a ledger. It's 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 a you know the ac accounting ledger was it's thousands of years old the idea, but basically what lo blockchain is allowing is a decentralized ledger that allows us to keep track of. Uh, you know each interaction, but not it, it's not guarded in a central location. So it's not something that one company or one institution or one country uh, oversees. It's something like the original design of the internet, where it's much more um, you know local scaled. And I think in the probably the best example we have at the moment of something that of the in the direction that I, I'm thinking is the internet. And I think a lot of the people who were involved in early blockchain, that was their enthusiasm for it, was seeing um, a kind of reinvention of a lot of models for governance uh, that could be applied in many different ways, but using a technology like blockchain that would allow for everyone to participate, much like a cooperative, but the complication of a cooperative is governance, again, it, it, without technology, is very localized, which makes it very difficult to, to be anything other than local. So uh, the answer to your question is no, the technology isn't going to save us, but we still we have to come together, and I think the technology can help us uh, learn how to create trust in the 21st century in a way that will be more uh, like what we actually need and how we're living and working today than the old institutions from the 20th century. So I think this is really inspiring. And in particular, now that we always hear this, you know, doom and gloom scenarios that, you know, technology is going to end the world and, you know, democracy is, is, is uh, at an end, but actually Yes, technology has changed the world that we live in, and it's changed it at a, at a very quick pace, but also it's part of the solution. Um, and, and the solution obviously has to be deeper than just reinstating the old forms of trust, but it's actually about inventing a new way to rebuild trust. And one of the things that, you know, you have been writing a lot about, you know, the sharing economy and your vision for the future is really an econ economy that is based on trust. And the problems we're facing today, whether it's, you know, climate change or a global pandemic, you see it more and more. The problems are also growing in scale from local level to, to global level. Um, what do you think will be the biggest challenge in moving from, you mentioned before, these, you know, networks of trust that were built on families and relations and actually knowing each other um, physically to having similar networks, but with millions, maybe billions of people across the planet uh, where you don't know each other and you can't see each other, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge in, in moving uh, and transitioning into this new form of trust? Well, that's a, that's a, quite the question. Um, you know, I think <laughs> that, <laughs> thank you for that, I think. Thank you, I think. Um, you know, I think that one of, the, one of the underpinnings of trust, especially in this situation, is empathy. Um, and, I've, and I think that for me, one of the, 
observations I have about building empathy um, in strange situations where I'm uncomfortable, the gateway is curiosity. Um, and so I think that the the opening for us, you know, we have two choices. The world is unknown. You know, the world is changing faster. We really don't know what's going to happen next. And um, we have two choices. We could be afraid or we could be curious. And so, you know, my uh, provocation and, in, and invitation to people is to be curious, to try to understand, um, you know, why is this happening? Why does this person have that opinion? Um, what can I learn from them? What are they seeing that I'm not seeing? And that's true in a business context or about like we have here beekeeping uh, and friends that we're learning from. You know, in, in every little community, we we have the need to understand what's happening. What are you doing differently? How is it working? Um, and I think that that's true in, in almost every aspect of life these days. So I, I feel that um, uh, it's quite a challenge for us to, to remake ourselves, but I also think it's very historically unusual to be in this inflection point between no more and not yet, because we're the people that can help to shape and accelerate uh, the not yet and, and make it more real. The alternative is to cling on to the no more and cry as it dissolves, you know. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm a fan of, of the former. Um, but I think your question is very uh, complex in a way because there's, there's different levels of, you know, who gets, who engages. And one of the things actually that we've seen with a variety of institutions um, working towards 21st century governance and models is that it's really important to engage the people that we refer to as the shapers. You know, people, for example, who are in compliance, who are trying to manage the, the fraud or the, the distrust, um, and include them because they realize also that the world is changing and um, they, we need them to participate, uh, not just to say no. So, um, so I think that that's also a really important piece is no matter where you are in the, in the community or in the organization, um, participating is, is fundamental because trust is fundamental. And we actually want your perspective. You know, we want, why do you make that face? <laughs> what do you think isn't going to work? Um, so that we engage people. I think that's our really only chance. As you can imagine, at Reimagine, we are also generally positive towards the future. But we, our starting point is the need to reimagine our basic concepts and to think outside the box and to really uh, dream of something different. You mentioned the importance of curiosity beforehand. How important do you think courage will be in the next year to actually dare to do this leap? I love that question. Um, and I think that it's courageous to ask it. And um, um, and I believe that, you know, we, my personal opinion is we're seeing certain types of crises accelerate beyond even what we thought scientifically would happen, whether it's, you know, the relationship between pa pandemics and climate. You know, there's been a lot of bad news in the last three to five years. I mean, relatively bad news after a relatively stable period, especially for us in the West. So I think that um, the, the more, the hotter the water becomes, the more likely we are to develop courage because the alternatives are kind of unsustainable conspicuously. And so for those of us that have been kind of bellwethers or early in the conversation about what, whatever it is, climate or technology or, or just, you know, inequality or pick a topic, um, I think a lot of the, the symptoms are, have been brewing, but the, the pain is increasing. And so I think that the, pain, the more the pain increases, the more courageous we'll be because what's the choice? What's the alternative? The alternative isn't comfort anymore. It's discomfort. Um, 
And so being human beings, which are basically walking nervous systems, um, <laughs> you know, I think when our nervous system gets to a point where the pain point hit, this says, okay, um, basta, uh, you know, then we jump. Um, and so I, I think courage, inviting people to be curious and courageous is, I, I don't know really what the job of the Imagine Europe is, but I'm, I'd love to help uh, make that part of what the kind of m mischief that you cause. <laughs> um, because I think that the opportunity is for really reimagining and reshaping is, is absolutely, this is the right time you know, and, um, and trust is, is an underlying currency, uh, which, um, you know, I think Erica, you, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking, um, <clears throat> and I think that it is a currency. It is a kind of a currency that is an, an entry ticket to the game in many cases. Um, and so, you know, we're building a community. We, we have a local phenomenon, which is all these different cities and communities throughout Europe. Um, at the same time, you know, we we realize that um, every community is different, all the, the culturally, uh, geologically, climate, etc. But I think the opportunity is is right here for us. Um, and reimagine Europe it seems like like as a meta community and a convener of really interesting conversations um just a, a wonderful i'll use my instigator you know and, and convener of of something that could really provoke um change so more than anything it, you know um if we could provoke change or accelerate and learn from each other and use your platform uh that you're shaping to to do that I mean, how much more, what else, what other value is there, <laughs> you know? Thank you very much for these words. Yes, let's, I'm absolutely going to take you up on that, so be careful. Let's reimagine not only trust together, but let's also start reimagining the future. Because I agree, if we have courage and curiosity and are working together, we could do something amazing of this new digital global world that we are um, creating. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you again. Thanks for the invitation. And I'll really look forward to meeting some of the people in your community.